Chapter 4 Elvis stood on the doorstep glaring down at Ruskin. Behind Elvis stood Sparky Walnut. Sparky was Ruskin's height, had a face full of freckles, crew-cut hair and always wore the clothes of an American baseball player, including a black cap. Give me my ball, you useless splinter, Elvis growled. Ruskin handed the ball back to him. Lumps of marmalade were stuck to it. You've made it all sticky, Elvis complained. Right, Sparky. Yes, sir, Sparky said. Sparky responded with yes, sir, to everything that Elvis said. Clean it, Elvis demanded, thrusting the ball into Ruskin's chest. Why should I? Ruskin asked. It's your fault it got into our breakfast. You shouldn't have smashed it through our window. Besides, it was my ball in the first place. You stole it from me. Ruskin stopped speaking as Elvis grabbed his frizzy hair and picked him up. Elvis stared into Ruskin's eyes, or rather his thick lensed glasses. What a thin, weak, ugly little splinter you are, Elvis said. Right, Sparky? Yes, sir, Sparky said. Now, Elvis continued, when I put you down, I want you to pick every bit of stickiness from my, repeat, my football. Got it? It was very uncomfortable to be held by the hair, so Ruskin said, all right, Elves put him down. Ruskin wiped the marmalade from the football. Good little splinter, Elvis said, taking the ball back, and he walked away down Lizard Street, followed by Sparky. Da boing, da boing, went the ball as Elvis bounced it. Ruskin closed the door and returned to the kitchen. What nasty boys your old friends have turned into, Wendy said. It's only Elvis, Ruskin said. Sparky's just afraid of him. And then he looked around. Where's Dad? Gone back to our bedroom, Wendy replied. He hid behind the gas cooker for a while, mumbling, it's not our fault, over and over again, and then sneaked upstairs in case there was any sign of trouble. You know what he's like. Wendy buttered a slice of toast and gave it to Ruskin. Take this up to him, love, she said. He didn't have a chance to finish his breakfast. I'll be late for school, began Ruskin. Oh, come on, dear, I don't ask you to do much. Just take it up. I've got all this mess to clear up and all I can see is toast and a broken glass. Oh, Polly Wally Doodle all the day. Chapter five. Ruskin's dad was sitting on the bed surrounded by model animals. Some of them were made of fluffy material, some plastic. There were all kinds of creatures, penguins, snakes, bats, elephants, lions, tigers, giraffes, bears, seals, dolphins. And every time Winston got fed up, he would sit on his bed and talk to them. Ruskin put the slice of toast on the bedside cabinet and sat next to his dad on the bed. How are the animals today, dad? He asked. Fine, Winston replied. The fluff's coming off the penguins, Ruskin noticed. It's not my fault, Winston replied. Years ago, before Ruskin was born, Winston had worked in a zoo. He wore a baggy dark green uniform with shiny buttons and a cap that wouldn't fit over his frizzy hair. Winston had been very happy when he was a zookeeper. He loved all the animals and looked after them carefully. And then one day he got the sack and he didn't have a job anymore. Winston missed all the animals, their snorts and howls and grunts and barks, their feathers and furs and fins, their distinctive smells, the way they recognised him, nuzzling him with snouts or pecking him with beaks. So Winston started to buy little toy animals to look after. He threw imaginary fish to the fluffy penguins and imaginary steaks to the plastic lions and tigers. You didn't finish your breakfast, Ruskin said. It's not my fault, Winston said. Dad, why did you get the sack from the zoo? I told you before. No, you haven't. Yes, I have, insisted Winston, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. Now go to school and stop bothering me. Chapter 6. When Ruskin got downstairs, he found his mum kneeling by the front door, her nose pressed to the letterbox. What are you doing? Ruskin asked. I can smell the drain, Wendy said. First a smashed window, now this, Polly Wally Doodle all the day. Just outside Ruskin's house was a huge drain. 
The cover to the drain was made of metal and it wobbled from side to side. Every time it wobbled, it went kakonk. In hot weather, the smell from the sewer rose up and escaped through the wobbling drain cover. Please get up, Mum, Ruskin said. I've got to go to school. When Ruskin opened the door, he found Dr Flowers outside, standing on the drain and sniffing. <laughs> Dr Flowers exploded. Dr Flowers' nose was bright red and his eyes were watering. All summer long, he sneezed and coughed and scratched his eyes. His pockets were stuffed full of handkerchiefs and he pulled one out now as he stared at Ruskin and Wendy. Hay fever, Dr Flowers said, blowing his nose. The only flowers on the street belong to... Achoo! He sneezed again. To Mr Lace. Dr Flowers looked over at Mr Lace's window boxes full of marigolds. And I can't ask him to... Achoo! To get rid of them. They're so... Achoo! Beautiful. Dr Flowers pulled another handkerchief from his pocket and he blew his nose again. I can see another one of your windows has been smashed by Elvis, Dr Flowers observed, sniffing to the wards yet another sneeze. Um, we haven't got many windows left, when Wendy told him. Mrs Walnut had her, <coughs> her shop window <coughs> broken. When? Ruskin asked. Last night, Dr Flowers replied, rubbing his eyes. Elvis was sleepwalking again. I heard the ball bouncing, but by the time I got to the street, it was too late. The window had already been smashed. Poor, poor, <laughs> poor Mrs Walnut. Oh, Polly Wally Doodle all the day, Wendy remarked. Someone should stop Elvis, Ruskin said. He's not a nice person. In fact, he's a menace. Who would dare stop him? Dr Flowers asked then. You know, who? I don't know, Ruskin replied. Some hero, I suppose. Talking of heroes, Dr Flowers said. I hear your school's choosing the hero for the <coughs> school play today. That's right, Ruskin said, and I want to play the part. Well, you've got competition. Why? Ruskin asked. Who else wants the part? Elvis Cave, of course, Dr Flowers answered. Chapter 7. Mr Lace, Ruskin's school teacher, stood in front of the class and sucked his pencil. Pencil sucking was Mr Lace's favourite pastime. Sometimes he had up to five pencils in his mouth at once. Apart from his mouth, he had pencils all in his pockets, behind his ears and even in his hair. Mr Lace was tall and thin and always wore a green scarf and a flower in his buttonhole. His most striking feature, however, was not his pencil sucking or green scarf or even his flower, but the way he sang his words when he spoke, as if singing along to music no one else could hear. Ruskin sat at the front of the class because he didn't have any friends. No one was sitting next to him. The only other person to have a whole desk to himself was Elvis Cave. Elvis, however, sat alone because his padded shoulders left no room for anyone else. He spent all his time talking to Sparky Walnut, who was sat at the desk behind him, or bouncing his ball. De boing the ball went. Heroes, 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 Mr Lace said, or sang. What a problem heroes can be, don't you think, class? Yes, Mr Lace, the class replied. Mr Lace ran his fingers through his hair. A few pencils fell to the floor. He picked one up and started to suck it. Who is to play a hero? Mr Lace sang. That is our problem and that's why we've got this. Mr Lace indicated something that had been at the front of the class since first thing that morning. No one knew what it was because it was covered with white sheets, but it was very big. Can you guess what's under the sheets? Mr Lace asked the class. A taxi cab, someone suggested. Uh -uh. Mr Lace replied. A speedboat, someone else suggested. No, 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 Mr Lace said, waving his hands in the air impatiently. It has something to do with our play, the class thought for a while. Is it alive or dead? Sparky asked. Well, it's dead now, but our imagination will bring it to glorious life. A tree, someone else suggested. No, 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 Mr Lace replied. A hill, no. A hill with live ants. No, Mr Lace was desperate now. 
He cried in frustration. More pencils were falling from his hair. You can't, you cannot be as silly as this. Think, class, think. Ruskin had guessed what was under the sheets ages ago, but he only spoke now. A dragon, Ruskin said in his squeaky whisper of a voice. Mr Lace looked at him and smiled triumphantly. At last! He exclaimed, of course! And he pulled the sheets away, revealing a large green dragon. It was made of paper and chicken wire with red milk bottle tops for its eyes and cardboard egg cartons for the humps on its back. It had claws, sharp teeth and a tail with a point at the end. Ruskin shuffled with excitement. Right, Mr Lay said, now you can see what you'll have to confront in the play. Who wants to do battle with the dragon? For a moment, no one moved. Come on, Mr Lay urged. Who's our hero? Elvis put his hand up. Only Elvis, Mr Lay asked, glancing at Ruskin. Slowly, Ruskin put his hand up as well. Very well, Mr Lay said. We have two contenders, Ruskin Splinter and Elvis Cave. Ruskin, you can be first. Come up to the front and stand next to the dragon. Ruskin's legs were shaking as he walked towards the front of the class. The dragon was so big beside him, he felt insignificant in its shadow. The class started to laugh. Shh! Mr Lace insisted. Give him chance to say his lines. But the laughing got louder. Shh, class! Mr Lace pleaded, waving his hands in the air. Give Ruskin a chance. But it was no good. The sight of Ruskin standing beside the dragon and wanting to be a hero was just too much for the class. Their laughter grew louder and louder and louder. Some of them pointed at Ruskin and cried, He's so small. He's so thin. His hair's all red and frizzy. Shh! Now, Mr Lace cried out. And then he looked at Ruskin and said, You better sit down, Ruskin. I'm afraid the idea of you playing the hero is making the class laugh so much they might all burst a blood vessel. Sadly and slowly, Ruskin walked back to his seat and sat down. The class stopped laughing. Elvis, come up to the front of the class and stand behind, beside the dragon, Mr Lace said. Elvis stood up and bounced his football. Da boing, da boing. He walked up to the dragon and stuck his fingers into one of its paper nostrils. I'm not afraid of you, Elvis said. Silly dragon. The class started to clap and cheer. They clapped and cheered Elvis every bit as loudly as they'd laughed and jeered at Ruskin. Elvis then egged them on and said, I'm the hero. Yeah, yeah. And the class responded, yeah, yeah and the roaring got louder. Very well, Mr Lay said. Elvis will be our hero. Da boing, da boing, da boing.